Do you remember at the end of yesterday's chapter, uh, Max got hit on the head by the telephone box door? I wonder what happens to him today. So this is part three of the Hodgehead. Meanwhile, back at number 5A, Pa had had a bonanza, sneaking next door and finding a full saucer of dog food and no sign of his neighbour. He'd scoffed the lot. He came staggering back, very full of himself and munchy meat, and fell into a deep, bloated sleep. Have you ever eaten so much that all you can do is just oh, have a lie down because you can't move? Ma woke him up just before dawn. Pa, she said, wake up. Max hasn't come back. Pa opened his eyes and saw her worried face and the three smaller but equally worried faces of Peony, Pansy and Petunia. He's been gone all night, said Ma. Oh, Pa, do you think something's happened to him? Pa got to his feet. I don't know, he said, but don't fret, Ma. I'll find him. But he could be anywhere. How are you going to know where to look? Before Pa could answer, he heard a strange voice coming from the hedge that divided 5A and 5B. Excuse me, said the strange voice, and out poked the head of their neighbour. Pa bristled, his spines standing on end. It's that munchy meat, he thought. He's found an empty saucer and he's going to cut up rough about it. He's going to accuse me, I know it. Well, I can play rough too. I don't like the look of him anyway. And if he wants a fight, he can have one. We'll soon see who's the better hog. But before he could think of anything to say, the hedgehog from 5B came out of the hedge and said again, Excuse me? Well, said Pa, I couldn't help overhearing what you were saying. Family matter, growled Pa. Exactly, you're worried about your little lad. Oh, cried Ma, have you seen him? Yes, I have. At least, I met a young chap in the park who said he was lost and looking for the way back to 5A. Unless, of course, it was 5A on some other street. Did you notice anything different about him? asked Ma quickly. The neighbour looked a trifle embarrassed. Well, yes, he said. Now that you mention it, he seemed to be having a little bit of difficulty with his speech. Muddled some of his words now and then. Like Hodgehead? Yes. That's how Max, cried Ma. Was he all right? asked Pa. Not hurt or anything. No, he was fine. I told him the best way to go home. He'll be along soon, I'm sure. Try not to worry. Pa cleared his throat awkwardly. His neighbour's kindness greatly added to his feelings of guilt. It's very decent of you, he said. Um, I'm glad to help. That's what neighbours are for. Can we offer you something, said Ma. Some bread and milk? Oh, no thanks, said the neighbour. I had a pretty good night's hunting in the park. Just as well, because when I got home, I found that something had eaten all my munchy meat. He looked directly at Pa and his eyes were twinkling. It was a cat, I expect, he said, and went back through the hedge. Wasn't that nice of him, said Ma, and Peony and Pansy and Petunia chanted, nice, nice, nice. Pa grunted. A part of him thought that he should confess his sin to his neighbour and tell him that he'd eaten all the munchy meat. But then another part of him, for he was very worldly wise, thought that least said was soonest mended. Life was full enough of headaches without inviting any extra ones. The same thought occurred to Max when at last he came to his senses. The door of the telephone booth had knocked him out cold and the neighbour from 5B had not noticed the still small figure as he hurried across the deserted street before the morning rush hour began. Oh, thought Max, has any hedgehog ever had a more horrible headache? The last bang I got made me talk a bit funny and I expect this one has made things even worse. I better try saying something. Oh, said Max, has any hedgehog ever had a more horrible headache? Max considered this. It sounded fine. Suddenly he felt fine. Even the ache already felt much less. My name, he said softly, is Victor Maximilian St George. And, he said more loudly, I have three sisters called Peony, Pansy and Petunia and I live with Pa and Ma at number 5A. And, he shouted at the top of his voice, I am a very lucky hedgehog. Without thinking, without listening, without a single glance, left or right, he dashed across the street, straight in front of the first of that morning's vehicles, the milk van. Oh dear. The noise that followed was enough to wake the whole street, 
First there was a screech as the milkman braked and swerved, and then came the shattering sound of dozens and dozens of bottles smashing. Lastly came the sound of the milkman's voice cursing every hedgehog ever born as he danced with rage in a sea of gold top and silver top, of semi-skimmed and skimmed, of orange juice and grapefruit juice, and of fresh farm eggs. Ma and Pa had sent the girls to bed and were waiting up in the growing light of dawn. They were crouching side by side listening when suddenly the dreadful racket burst upon their ears. Sounds like something's got run over, said Pa heavily. Brace yourself, old lady. It could be our Max. Ma buried her head and rolled herself into a ball of misery. At that moment, they heard a cheery voice. Now, now, it said. What's all this fuss about? There's no point in crying over spilt milk. What a happy scene of grunting, snuffling, squeaking joy there was in the garden of 5A as the girls were woken to be told the good news and what a jolly crunching of snails there was at the family celebrated with a, with a feast. After all, Max slept heavily and by evening, when he reappeared, the neighbour had come through the hedge twice, once to inquire if Max was back and again to ask if he was quite well. At first, Ma and Pa felt a little uncomfortable at these visits. Ma, because she knew what Pa had done, and Pa, because he knew that the neighbour knew. But the matter was not mentioned. They had been wrong, they found, in supposing that a family of hedgehogs lived next door. The neighbour had never married, and as elderly bachelors often are, that's a bachelor is a man who's never got married, he was rather lonely and very fond of children. He had already invited Peony, Pansy and Petunia to come and play in his garden whenever they liked and seeing that they were not sure how to address him, he'd asked them to call him Uncle. Uncle what, they said. The neighbour scratched his head with his hind foot. Let's see now. I live in the garden of number 5B, so how about Uncle B? After dark, the family were worm hunting on the lawn when there was a rustling in the dividing hedge and the three girls ran towards it, crying, Uncle B, Uncle B, Uncle B. Who's Uncle B? asked Max. Our next door neighbour, said Ma. That's what the girls call him. They've been playing in his garden. But Pa, said Max, I thought you couldn't stand him. Pa was saved from replying by the approach of Uncle B and now Max recognised him. Oh, hello, sir, he said politely. You're the gentle hog I met in the park. Thank you very much for your help. Don't mention it, Max, said Uncle B. Glad to hear from your parents that you're um, totally recovered. You should stay in the garden, son, said Pa. You're safe in here. Max considered this. He had no intention of giving up his research. The neighbour had helped him once. Maybe he could do so again. As if reading his thoughts, Uncle B said, well, I must be running along now. Any time you feel like having a chat, Max, you just pop over. The next night, Max popped over. Hello, young fellow, said Uncle B. Have some munchy meat. They always give me more than I can manage. No, thanks. It's, it's your advice I need, said Max, getting straight to the point. Shoot, said Uncle B. He listened carefully while Max told him everything that had happened so far in his efforts to find a safe hedgehog crossing. I must say, he said when Max had finished, I admire your spirit and your ambition. Finding a really safe way to cross roads would benefit the whole of hedgehog kind. But the two methods that humans use don't seem to be suitable for us. No better, it appears from your experiences, than the old time-honoured way. Look right, look left, look right again before going across. One thing strikes me, however, Uncle B paused. What's that, Uncle B? All your research so far has been at night time because hedgehogs are nocturnal, but humans aren't. They don't set, set all well. They don't see it all well at night, which is why they keep on clobbering us. Now, if you could only find a place to cross in broad daylight, then at least they could see us coming. It might pay us to change our habits. Better to lose your sleep than your life, that's what I say. Well, said Max, I suppose that either of the two ways I've tried would work in the daylight too. Trouble is, with either of them, you've got to get across so quickly. Now, if only there was a human who could stop the traffic and make absolutely sure it didn't move until you were safely over. Hmm. 
I wonder if there is a human that would stop the traffic and wait till you're safely over until they let the cars go past. Have a little think about that and we'll catch up with Max tomorrow.